Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to call to order the meeting of the San City of Santa Rosa Design Review Board on April 18th, currently 432. Welcome, everyone. Um, I would like to have a roll call, Patty. Let the record reflect that all board members are present except for Vice Chair Hedgeman. Thank you. And approval of the minutes. We have minutes from March 7th, 2019. Any corrections to the minutes, comments? Seeing none, minutes are good. Board business. Uh, so we have two items to discuss on board business. The first item is the Waterways Advisory Committee, which has a design review board seat that is appointed. Uh, we did receive interest from a board member. And uh, before we have uh, official appointment, were any other board members interested in serving on the advisory committee? Okay, then I happily report that Adam Sharon will take that seat on the Waterways Committee. So thank you, Adam. I greatly appreciate more volunteerism. <laughs> and <clears throat> those of you who are newer to the board, uh, the waterways will report out um, on board member reports when they do have meetings and there's um, waterways discussions and it will generally inform us on uh, some design review items mainly with site et cetera et cetera so uh, the second item of board business is that we the board are having a gathering after this meeting and uh, we are saying goodbye to our old members who have moved on and we're saying hello to our new members and this is something that we regularly do a little social gathering to get to know each other a little better we don't discuss any board business that's why staff comes with us to make sure that we do not okay um, I'd like to open it up to public comment is there anyone I didn't read my board business sorry let me let me read the purview of this board first and then we'll get on to public comment um, so, design review board, project review, the review authority shall consider the location, design, site plan configuration, and the overall effect of the proposed project upon surrounding properties and the city in general. Review shall be conducted by comparing the proposed project to the general plan, any applicable specific plan, applicable zoning code standards and requirements, consistency of the project within the city's design guidelines, architectural criteria for special areas and other applicable city requirements. So that's the purview of this board. Now moving on to public comment for any item that is not currently on the agenda, but would be under the purview of this board. Yes, sir. Do you need to do something to join turn the hearing aid telecoil loop on? The question is about the uh, hearing telecoil loop for those who couldn't hear the gentleman in the back. Shall we pause for a moment while we check on that? Okay. 
We're having uh, technical difficulties, so we're going to go ahead and have a five-minute recess. We'll re-adjourn it. I mean, we'll reconvene at that time.
Willard, how's it working? Thumbs up? <laughs> Willard, can you hear me? Bingo. All right. Thank you all. Appreciate it. We good? Or we want to wait a second? We're going to wait one more second. We got one more uh, piece of technical difficulty to work out. Um, it's uh, Adams. Okay, and we are officially back in action, calling the meeting back to order. Uh, for those of you just joining us, we have made it through agenda items one through three. We were just about to start a public comment on items that are not on today's agenda, but would be under the purview of the Design Review Board. Do I have any public comment for things not on today's agenda? Seeing no one approaching the microphone, I will close public comment for items not on the agenda. Item number five, statements of abstentions by board members. Are there any board members that need to abstain from this item? Brett? Um, I don't know what, uh, Brett Cordenbrock. Uh, I need to, yeah, I need to abstain due to involvements in projects adjacent to and impacted by this uh, this agenda item, so thank you. I appreciate you following protocol and showing up to the meeting and letting us know why you have to abstain and uh, hopefully we'll see you later at the, are you gonna come back after the item or are you gonna come to the event or? Okay, wonderful, we will, uh, we will see you all, we will see you there. Thanks Brett. Anybody else need to abstain from this item? All right. Give Brett a moment to exit and we will get on to our scheduled items. Okay, so we are on to scheduled items. We have a concept design review item for US 101 Bicycle and Pedestrian Bridge. And I will turn it over to staff for a staff report. 
Great, thank you, Chair Kincaid and members of the Design Review Board. Uh, I'm pleased to present to you tonight a concept design review for the US 101 Bicycle and Pedestrian Bridge. As the Design Review Board is uh, well aware, staff does not do a comprehensive, planning staff does not do a comprehensive analysis of a concept design review item. Um, this project will actually be presented by a combination of city staff from our capital projects engineering team, uh, as well as a design consultant that has been working with the city. Uh, I did wanna say a couple things about this project. So it's a, um, it's a unique project. We don't get bicycle and pedestrian bridges very often. Uh, the other thing we don't have happen very often is for a city-sponsored project to come before the design review board. So the typical protocol is that a city project does not uh, go through design review. In fact, it's not subject to the zoning code. So tonight's review uh, is a courtesy review. We are actually looking at that a little bit more closely to see if indeed this project um, truly will not come back to the design review board or not. So there will be some internal meetings here in the next couple of weeks to discuss that further. So uh, I don't wanna say that it will or won't come back to the design review board, but I think as it stands now, the, the typical practice is it's not subject to design review. So this may be the last time you see it. I will keep the board posted though on any uh, news related to that. Um, before I turn it over to the um, city staff that's been working on this project, I did want to introduce to you, uh, to my left, Sherry Meads. She's the newest addition to our planning team. Uh, she'll be assisting me at the staff table tonight, uh, and hopefully you'll be seeing her presenting items before you here in the not too distant future. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Chris Catbagan. He's with the Capital Projects Engineering Team here at the city. And uh, he's gonna introduce this item as well as introduce the consultant working with us. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Kincaid and board members. I'm Chris Catbagan with the city's Transportation and Public Works Department. I am the project engineer managing the future Highway 101 Bicycle and Pedestrian Bridge Project. For over a decade, the city has been pursuing the proposal of a bridge, which spans the Highway 101 for the northern half of Santa Rosa. Although the bridge improvement would be utilizing Caltrans right-of-way, this is and uh, the city uses the project sponsor and the lead designer. Currently, our design team continues to generate technical studies with the clear objective of obtaining environmental clearance for a project. As part of the environmental requirements in Caltrans project delivery process, we have been providing various studies for Caltrans review. So today we are looking to add to our technical studies based on potential feedback. Today our design consultant, uh, BKF Civil Engineering and SGA Architects will show two bridge locations and present three different bridge structure types. And, um, I wanna emphasize that none of these locations have been environmentally cleared. So we are specifically looking for constructed feedback in regards to uh, aesthetics and uh, the bridge structure type for both locations. Um, with that said, I'd like to turn the presentation over to Stephen Grover from SGA Architects and BKF Engineering, Natalina Bernardi. Sorry. Thank, you. Thank you. Stephen has laryngitis, so I, the civil engineer, is going to make the presentation, so I apologize beforehand because I'm not as eloquent, but I'll, get, I'll do my best. Um, Chris explained the project well, but I just want to give a little bit more context. Uh, the project is meant to provide a crossing over 101, a pedestrian and bike crossing between the Steel Avenue interchange of 101 and College Avenue interchange. Um, if you ever traveled either interchange, it's uh, very congested and uh, you're, it, it's not, not safe for the casual bike rider or the pedestrian. So this is actually a, a very important improvement, um, one that the city and Stephen actually have been working on since 2007. Uh, here we have an, an area map of the location that we're proposing a, uh, the overcrossing, the bridge. Uh, 
In 2007 through about 2016, several alignments were uh, assessed in terms of the best location in order to situate the bridge. Uh, there was actually three alignments that were uh, evaluated, one in the northern location at Edwards and Elliott. Uh, that's on the north side of Santa Rosa Junior College. Uh, a second location at Jennings Avenue, which is a little uh, further south. Uh, and that one there actually would have touched down at Armory. Uh, and then also uh, the, the most southern alignment at Bear Cubs Way, uh, which is uh, straddles actually Santa Rosa Junior College and Santa Rosa High School. The intent here was to provide connectivity and complete the bike pedestrian uh, circulation between Mendocino Avenue and the Smart Railroad Corridor, which has since come into fruition. Now the Jennings alternative was discounted and is no longer an, uh, an alternative that we're looking at due to the impacts in the residential neighborhood. A year is a larger uh, picture of the area that shows the transportation uh, network um, in terms of bikes and peds and how this, the particular connections, the two locations that we're looking at would advance uh, the connection and the transportation element, getting those from the east side to the west side and making the connections to the smart uh, railroad corridor. Uh, additionally, it's important to uh, note that the uh, project is in the 2012 North Santa Rosa Station uh, area plan. So it is an, an element that's uh, seen as being important to this particular area. As I mentioned, we've been working on this project since 2007. Um, with that, there's been a feasibility study that was uh, completed in 2010, uh, as shown here on your left, and also a uh, project uh, initiation document. That there is a document, a uh, planning document, that is a Caltrans type document that was uh, it's completed in 2016, signed by the city and Caltrans. So Caltrans does see this as a viable project moving forward. With the completion of that planning phase, we are in the environmental uh, documentation phase. So we're not into detailed designs, but we are um, designing up to a point so we could do those technical evaluations in terms of environmental considerations and impacts. So the geometrics have been established for each location. And now we're also looking at uh, the bridge type. Uh, crossing 101 and also crossing its spanning Armory and Cleveland, which are the frontage roads on both sides of 101. In looking at the bridge type, uh, we've been very considerate of the uh, architecture that's appropriate for the city of Santa Rosa and for this particular location. Additionally, we've had several community meetings and what we've heard from the community we're you know, taking into account and basically what we've been hearing time and time again is please build the bridge. And that's the, been the most important aspect of their, uh, of their emphasis. Oh shoot, I'm sorry. Some key considerations um, in determining the type of the bridge uh, that we'll be um, proposing across 101, which is really why we're here before you, uh, is the alignment. Uh, at, when we started uh, with the feasibility study, we were looking at alignments that were not perpendicular to 101, were actually skewed. And what that did, it limited the type of uh, bridge, uh, bridge types that we could construct. Now with the straight alignment in particular at Edwards and Elliott, what it does, it allows us to build certain type of bridges that um, could be supported in a straight alignment. Additionally, utilities, uh, if you've been to the site, you'll notice there's considerable amount of utilities and the overhead electrical utilities do limit us to, uh, to in construction. So that's been considered also. Uh, geometric constraints, uh, concrete box structures are the least expensive type of bridges. Unfortunately, geometrically, um, we're constrained vertically. 
in or, in what we need is a very shallow deck depth. And we'll go into that a little bit um, later to show you. And also, we do not have a center span on 101. Uh, Caltrans, with the knowledge that a bridge could be built uh, without a center column, had um, basically to had the design team and the project consider bridge types that do not have columns in, along, in, on 101 right away. On the west side of 101 in this location is a com our commercial sites. You have uh, Dick's Sporting Goods, Cottingtown, and you have to also Myers Restaurants. Uh, each of those sites are very visible from the highway and they've each asked to maintain that visibility. So that's been a consideration also. Uh, in terms of construction process and how we build the bridge, it's important to consider closures. Closing the freeway is obviously gonna be a more complex element um, and more difficult to do and obtain approval than a bridge type construction that would not require its closure. Also, lay down areas and things of that nature have been considered. In terms of visual context, uh, we'll be showing you pictures from uh, the site, and you'll see that it's, it's a very open area, so we want to ensure that we do not, we complement that. Um, and also, in the northbound directions, there's the backdrop of the hills and whether it seemed appropriate to maintain that particular visual. And as I said, the community preference was very important and, and that preference was do what you can to build this structure. Year, I'm sorry, oh yeah. So yeah, thank you, Stephen. So these, these considerations, and I apologize for being so lengthy with them, basically, um, it, resulted in three bridge types that we could look at. One was a, a through truss bridge, the second was a tide arch, and then the third was a cable state bridge. Year, uh, you'll see truss structures that are located within Santa Rosa. Um, you'll notice that these truss structures have considerable mass and they're appropriate for their location because they're complemented by trees and other you know, things that does, does not highlight their mass. Years are particular location at Owards and Elliott, and you're looking northbound, and as we were indicating earlier, you see that it's very open you'll see a lot of sky and you'll see the, 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 um, the uh, Shiloh Ranch Hills in the background. This is in the southbound direction, although you don't have the hills in the background. Again, it's fairly open, um, a very wide area with not a lot of mass on either side. This year is the um, Range Bear Cub location, which is, you know, but a not even a quarter mile south of the Edwards and Elliott location. So you'll see very similar perspectives here. Northbound, you still see the hills, still a wide area. Oops, excuse me. And then in the southbound direction for the Bear Cub location, again, very wide area, uh, very open. Here's an aerial view of the Edwards and Elliott location. Um, as we were speaking to earlier, you'll notice that on your left side, which is the west side, is uh, commercial sites. There's Cotting Town uh, towards the top of the slide. Uh, we have Dick's Sporting Goods. Also, um, in matter of fact, the bridge will be landing directly below on, uh, at Edwards. Uh, there, uh, right, right in front of Dick's Sporting Goods, on its uh, the side entrance, loading dock entrance, and then on the east side is the Santa Clara uh, Junior College. I'm sorry, Santa Rosa. I'm sorry, Santa Rosa Junior College. Yes. Uh, here's the Range and Bear Cub location. Uh, 
again on the left side is the commercial site. You'll see a parking lot in the center of the slide there. That's where the bridge will be landing um, to on top of, up towards that parking lot is Meyer's restaurant. And then on the uh, right side, the east side, is the, again, Santa Rosa Junior College. And we'll be landing within their parking lot. This year, um, back in 2010, as noted in the slide, there were some renderings done for this particular uh, crossing. Uh, but at the time that they were done, there was a planned development on the west side in lieu of dicks. So it was a more dense type of planned development. So therefore, the proposal for this bridge crossing was a truss, and you could see that up, up on top, that was very, more mass, very massive and dense. Here is a, um, a, an example of, uh, of, a, of a bridge um, that, again, sh is, makes a statement, but it does, it's considerably heavy, and we as the designers feel it may be too heavy for the particular location that we're proposing the overcrossing. Here is an archway. Um, it would be, this archway here actually represents the length of the span that we would, we would be proposing for our overcrossing. So again, you could see what type of um, mass you would be dealing with in terms of over 101 and armory in Cleveland. This year is an uh, through truss, um, and although it's open, there's a lot of elements involved, uh, and what that does, it leads to considerable amount of maintenance. Um, and again, it's open, but there's elements creating a look of being substantial. This year is a project in San Diego. Uh, this year is a cable state uh, bridge. And um, what that does, it, it, you know, it basically has, it, it's very light. You could see through it and it, it grabs attention. Other bridges that are lighter than what we saw previously um, are shown here. These here are the arch bridges, but again, they could be very considerable in depth and um, making a statement. What this team is actually looking um, towards in terms of bridge type is something that's more simplistic, a little thinner and lighter, at least gives you the impression as such. Uh, here's an example of a type of bridge we would be looking at. We, a concrete girder, although not very expensive, it's the least expensive type of bridge construction. If you look at the upper right, what it does, it poses a pretty deep deck depth. And although it works well for many overcrossings, we, in our particular situation, we have to keep the deck depth narrow due to our vertical clearances and our touchdown points. We basically have to be over 101. We have to clear 101 by 18 and a half feet. Additionally, we have Armory and Cleveland on either side adjacent to 101. That has to be cleared by 17 feet. Both of those are Caltrans standards that we cannot deviate from. In the Edwards and Elliott alternative, we additionally have the complexity of a driveway to Dick Sporting Good having to cl be cleared by 14 and a half feet to meet the fire, uh, fire marshal's requirements. So even though we're past Cleveland, 
we have the driveway right there at, uh, at Dix that we have to be 14 and a half feet clear. And then we have the loading dock, which is the next westerly driveway where we have to conform prior to get, getting to the loading dock. So we're very, very constrained from a vertical alignment perspective and need to minimize that deck depth as much as possible in order to uh, ensure that we make those conforms. Here's some um, visuals and renderings of what we're speaking to. This is coming from 101 uh, towards the west, following parallel to Dick's, uh, Dick's Sporting Goods, and there is a touchdown point where just towards me, right after that touchdown point, is the loading dock entrance. A, here's just another perspective of it, but you could see on the far right, we attempted to show a fire truck and uh, the proximity to the touchdown point into that fire truck is basically controlling much of the vertical alignment. And here's a, a visual from top. Year we attempted to show how one foot of deck depth really tends to increase the length of the proposed uh, ramp in order to touch down. So one foot yields 40 feet of additional ramp. So we had a look at very thin structures, um, some thin st some structures that were thin were the arch structure. Uh, here's an example in Walnut Creek in the lower right. Um, thin, light, uh, we feel appropriate for this particular location. Here are some butterfly truss structures. Um, because of the openness of the area, we would recommend an open butterfly, which is shown on the left, but maybe not 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 as much uh, thickness in terms of its wings or truss. Other examples of light arches. So here we we uh, have placed an arch type bridge at our particular location. And this is at Edwards and Elliott, looking north. And then at Bear Cub, also looking in the northbound direction. In addition to a arch, we feel a cable state bridge would also be an appropriate type for this particular location. Uh, here's an example of a Cable State Bridge built over 280 in Mary Avenue. And it too has the power poles in the background, similarly to our location. You can see they, they blend in, and it has a, a pretty wide open space, similarly to our 101 location. Here's a cross section of the Cable State Bridge, and you could see based on the cross section, it yields the least uh, deep deck depth. Another example of a very light, open Cable State Bridge. year we have placed the Cable State Bridge on our particular project. Uh, what we would recommend for the Cable State Bridge is just to have towers on the east side. Um, the, the west side, as we mentioned earlier, is a commercial site, and we thought we may want not to put towers there in order to not obstruct uh, the, the, um, the, the signage from all the commercial sites there. Uh, additionally, it seems as if the east side has a, is a little bit more dense existing and might uh, better accept the, the towers. 
this year is at the Bear Cub location. And you could see there's not much difference between the two locations um, that would predicate different type of bridges. Uh, it's mainly alignment issues. This year is our overall site. Um, the reason that we sh we've shown this is primarily due to stage construction. The big difference between a arch bridge and a cable state bridge is how they're constructed. An arch bridge would have to be constructed in one, be placed over 101 in one, in, 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 in one construction period. So that would require the full closures of 101, redirecting traffic in the evenings onto Mendocino and to Range Avenue. In a cable state scenario, all we have to do is set the tower, which will require the closure of armory in that specific area for a few hours. And then what we would do is we would build segments of the bridge across 101 with lane closures on 101 as opposed to full closures. So the cable state um, type of bridge offers us considerable uh, ease in staging uh, during construction. And, and that's, there is just the Bear Cup location. So in summary, uh, the concrete box bridge, although the least expensive, will not work for our particular scenario due to the vertical clearances issue and requiring minimal deck depth. Uh, the truss, although may be appropriate, it's, it has very heavy members and, and it also requires considerable maintenance. So it would not be our recommendation to go with a truss type bridge. The tide arch, is, does work structurally for, for this location. Uh, the, the, and it, it can be very open, which we would recommend, but in terms of constructability, in terms of stage construction and requiring the closures of 101, uh, it may not be uh, as amenable for this particular location as would a cable state bridge that could be done in, in segmentally it offers the openness, especially if we were to set the tower on the east side. Um, and it's also very light. Here's examples of particular aesthetic features that we'll be looking at, not in this particular phase of the design, because we only are talking about environmental clearance, but in the next phase, when we get into the details, we'll be very, uh, we're, we're gonna be very careful to look at the type of fencing that will be placed on the bridge, as well as uh, colors and claddings that may be appropriate uh, for the aesthetics that uh, surround the, the particular area. And that's the conclusion of the presentation. Thank you very much. Any final words from staff? No, so the, this is, uh, like I said, it's a little unusual, but we'd like to conduct it like a typical concept design review. Uh, we do have some design guidelines that could be uh, applicable. We also, uh, happy to entertain any questions that the board might have, and then uh, we do have some members of the public. So although not a public hearing, staff would recommend that we uh, take public comment as well. Thank you, Bill, and a uh, wonderful presentation. I didn't, we didn't hear Stephen talk, so I don't know how eloquent he is, he but you been. certainly are as well. Um, <clears throat> at this point in time, before we bring it to the board, I'd like to take public comment. Um, so I do have two speaker cards, I'm not necessarily going to uh, allow other, I mean, not allow other people to speak if you want to after the two speaker cards, but since I do have two, I'll take them in the order in which received. So uh, first up, we have Eris Weaver from the Sonoma County Bicycle Coalition.
Good evening. I am so glad that we are moving forward with this whole uh, structure that will help folks get across uh, 101 more safely. Um, I am agnostic as to what kind of bridge or the, the visuals of the impact. Uh, my concern is more the placement and what is going to actually be the most useful for people getting from point A to point B. And when you look at desire lines and where people are where the where the um, the uh, destinations are that people are going to go. Uh, the northernmost crossing at Elliott and Edwards makes the most sense. It's closer to the train station, closer to Cotting Town. There's already existing streets on either side, uh, whereas the southern approach, uh, one coming from the east to the west, has to pass through the junior college, even if you're not a college student, there seems challenges there for people trying to get from one place to another. So um, location, 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 just like any other real estate. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Weaver. Next card I have is Willard Richards. Mr. Richards. Willard Richards, I live on Highland Drive just north of the uh, JC neighborhood. Um, I was delighted to read the attachments to this agenda package and see the uh, cable uh, stay bridge. It's uh, much better than anything I've seen previously. I, I think the previous version had some uh, wiggles in it as it crossed Highway 1, and I'm delighted to see those go away. Also, I'm glad to see that it goes behind the traffic sign so that, that, that that's not a uh, problem. Um, and I first began paying attention to this uh, project when Stephen Grover first came to town. Uh, I'm not sure how many years ago that is, and I'm not sure how many meetings I've attended where uh, he's been making presentations, but it, it's been, been a long time. Uh, and I thank him for his uh, persistence, perseverance, and uh, good design. I've always been an advocate of the Edwards Elliott um, uh, alignment. Uh, I've participated in uh, meetings with Cottingtown when they owned the property where Dick's uh, Sporting Goods is now. Um, and um, uh, at the time, I thought that, that that alignment w was possible as far as they were concerned. Um, I can't see any reason that Dick Sporting Goods wouldn't be delighted to have uh, thousands of JST uh, students have a quick connection to their door. So I'm a little bit confused by the property owner's uh, discomfort uh, with that alignment. And uh, um, I, I hope uh, very much that the uh, city can proceed with that. Um, part of the reason I... Uh, the Bear Cub alignment is a little bit longer walk, but that's not the thing that concerns me. The thing that concerns me is that the, the, the uh, east end of the bridge uh, is somewhere down beyond the parking lots on the JC campus if for the Bear Cub alignment, but for the Edwards Elliott alignment, it's right in the middle of where the students are, they can see it. Furthermore, the Bear Cub alignment doesn't go anywhere you want to go uh, uh, other than over near the Smart Station, uh, whereas um, the Edwards Elliott alignment takes you to Cot Cottingtown, where there are all the stores, the post office, uh, and uh, the other services. And so I think there are just tremendous ad advantages to the northern alignment. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Richards, for your time this afternoon and for your continued following of the project. Okay, uh, next speaker card, I have uh, Mr. David Harris. Good afternoon, yes, my name is David Harris. I live uh, at 355 Gemma Circle. Uh, I'm also someone who's been following this project for many years, uh, 2004, uh, really prompted by the time that the JC was proposing its parking structure. And a, this overcrossing was a, in my opinion, very viable alternative to the, 
what in the end was $38 million that the JC spent to add 633 parking places. I mean, $60,000 a parking place, I think we need to think about other ways for people to get places when uh, it costs more to park a car than, than it will ever get back. And uh, I, I suppose if we were to do economic analysis on the bridge, uh, what are the uh, benefits, economic benefits it's gonna bring, but certainly in reducing congestion on Mendocino and actually providing viable alternatives for people to be able to use SMART, et cetera. We are in, a, in 2004, this was much less fuzzier that we needed alternative ways for people to access. But the other thing, having thought about this for so many years and having talked to Stephen Grover and other people about this also for many years, uh, the unique thing about this location, I mean, we've been looking pretty close, but a little farther to the west and north is the complex of the Schultz Empire, <laughs> uh, I would call it. And uh, you drive up 101 here, uh, there's Redwood Empire Ice Arena, uh, of course, their gift shop there in another building. Uh, subsequently, they built the uh, Schultz Museum. Uh, Schultz Creative is over there and the Children's Museum. We have destinations there that would benefit from a placemaker in the place, in the location of this bridge. And that kind of thing needs to be thought about in advance. Um, the hills are nice there, but we got another 100 miles of 101 to look at the hills. I think this is a spot where we should seriously consider a real design issue and put something there that puts the stamp of what one of the things that makes Santa Rosa famous. We, you know, it's not the right place to put something uh, to, uh, in memory of uh, Burbank, but it certainly would be the right place to put something uh, that shows our peanuts, Snoopy, Charles Schultz, all of the stuff that is very important to Santa Rosa's really uh, world draw as a tourist attraction. I mean, I'm not even mentioning wine. That's the other thing you could put there, right? There could be grapes in that design. But I like these cable stay. I like these light designs, but I would really raise the question of whether we should go back and think about what we could do as a placemaker. What images on that bridge would really, people would remember and would also bring to people's consciousness what is just off there to the left. Um, the attractions there, four major attractions that I think we really need to think about. And Caltrans has very strict guidelines. I mean, you can't after the fact, after you've submitted plans, et cetera, even paint an image on a Caltrans uh, right away. So I would, particularly appeal to the design side uh, of this group to think about placemakers, because we don't have that many placemakers. We, we could have other, you know, statuary along 101, we don't have any. I mean, we, we got a bicycle obelisk down here that most people don't even notice, but we have very few things that are, where the architecture conveys an important story about what has made Santa Rosa world known. And that is you know, the Schultz. And you know, the question of economics, how's this bridge gonna be paid for? Maybe there's a way to tie those things together. Thank you. Thank you for your words, Mr. Harris. Next speaker I have is Jenny Bard. Hello and good afternoon, everyone. Here I am. <laughs> Um, my name is Jenny Bard and I live in the JC neighborhood and um, I'm a member of the board of the Sonoma County Bicycle Coalition. So, and like David said, has, have been involved in the uh, planning of this, the support of this, the promotion of this for many, many years. And so it's very, very exciting to see these designs, and um, I totally support what the other speakers have said before me. Um, I'd like to add to that, um, to go bold and go visionary in the design. This, we hope, really will put Santa Rosa on the map. So I urge you to, um, to think big 
and the impact this will have on our city in helping us promote more people getting out on their bicycles, more people walking, getting out of their cars. This is a huge um, piece of the puzzle that we have been missing forever. And now we will finally be able to connect the east and west parts of Santa Rosa safely. Um, the other thing I would add, I would encourage you to select a design that has the broadest visibility from outside and looking up at it so that people feel safe using it. If there is a corridor, if there's some sort of fencing, um, it should be clear. And it's the least amount of barriers that prevent visibility so people feel safe every step of the way on that bridge, starting and stopping. So I thank you for being the first uh, Santa Rosa board to look at this, these designs and helping us bring this to fruition. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bard. Next we have Rick Coates. Yes, Rick Coates and I represent a nonprofit uh, called Eco Ring, which promotes ecotourism and green travel. Uh, so aesthetics are, are certainly a consideration here. Uh, I do like the open cable design there. It, uh, I think, is aesthetically pleasing. Um, I took the opportunity to actually walk the site this afternoon. And as I walked along Elliot, I was struck by two things. The first was the ugly power lines that go across the freeway there and, and line the line Elliot. And I'm just hoping that whatever design comes out of this will eliminate those lines. Perhaps they can be disguised in a conduit of some sort with the bridge. Uh, that would be really nice. Uh, the second thing I noted was the uh, pedestrian traffic, the students, was quite heavy on Elliot, not so on Bear Cub. I think that it, from a utilitarian standpoint, it would tap into much, much more traffic, uh, pedestrian traffic, uh, um, in the Elliot position. And of course, the destination of Cottingtown is quite important. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Coates. Uh, Thomas Ells. Good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to speak um, and addressing this design issue. Um, one aspect, so I, without negating anything that has been said here in the moments before, uh, from public comment anyway, certainly, uh, meaning a statement and the electrical wires and and doing various things. It occurred to me as I was watching this, first of all, I'm a civil engineer uh, myself, and the city doesn't have money for this right now, and so it's going to have to, it's going to have to understand or think about the expense um, so that could delay the actual work from, from my observation. I'd like to get it as soon as possible. It would be good to be a statement. It might be possible to look at, at a box girder in a different way because what it does is it's holding itself and anything you put on it or hang from it. So you could, instead of having the deck on top of it, you could put it higher and hang from it the lower deck, a deck hung below that could be very shallow, very thin. And it would kind of be a cross between the, the, the butterfly arch type or something like that and, and the uh, box girder. So it would kind of be a combination of that, but it, would, it could have a very uh, much less expense than the other types, which involve very, very significant design aspects like these. You know, T.Y. Lynn International, the other ones who do these, like if we remember what happened with, with the Bay Bridge, is that it became extremely expensive, not necessarily T.Y. Lynn's design, but when it went through everything, the complexities and everything became extremely expensive. Not to say this would be extremely expensive, just probably a lot more than Santa Rosa wants to spend 
but there could be some other designs, for instance, because the boxes are very readily designed, very simple, very easy, and then on top of that, you could put the artwork or anything that you want. Thank you, Mr. Ells. Next up, we have Steve Bertelbaugh. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members. I'm Steve Bertelbaugh with the Transportation and Land Use Coalition. Uh, I really want to commend Stephen Grover for working through this project for its long, long life. Um, and uh, uh, the concept, as it's been described, really appeals to me. Uh, in particular, um, I like the fact that we've straightened out the east side of it. Uh, that seems to be the result of more cooperation from the college. Um, and uh, the north section does appeal to all of us uh, much more than the south option. Uh, that's where the people are. A difference of a half a mile means a great deal to folks because, as we understand, people on foot are willing to walk about a half mile to a destination. But if you add another half mile, uh, they're likely to get in the car. And our whole objective nowadays is to get cars off the road. Uh, we're getting pretty congested. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bertelbaugh. Danny Sheehan. Hopefully I'm the last. <laughs> I represent Friends of Smart. Uh, with the decades of knowledge, and I'm just here to say that we support the Cable State Bridge at the northern uh, Elliott Edwards crossing. Thank you, Ms. Sheehan. Although I don't have any more cards, I will uh, ask if there are any other members of the public who wish to speak on this item. Seeing none, I will close the public comment period. Bring it back to the for the board for comments. Mr. Wicks, dare I call on you to uh, kick off the board comments? I dare. You can uh, questions and comments are fine. Uh, we'll keep it pretty. Uh, yeah, we'll keep it pretty loose with structure. All right. <clears throat> my my first uh, questions for staff. Um, are you looking for our comments on? where it's touching down as well as the design of the bridge? Yeah, I, th <clears throat> I think it's pretty free form at this point. Uh, I'll let the project manager comment, uh, but a couple of locations have been provided and then as you've heard, some design ideas with a preference toward the, uh, the cable stayed. Okay, thank you. Um, for the presenters, um, did um, just out of curiosity, the butterfly truss option, if it were to be considered, um, how long would 101 have to be closed to put in a bridge of that style? I'm going to minimize my speaking. I appreciate your um, uh, you're talking about the butterfly tied arch. Yes. Okay. Um, so. There are a couple different ways to build that. The most cost-effective way is what Natalina mentioned, which is to assemble something uh, nearby and lift it into place. Um, this type of bridge has been built, and um, there are other precedents for it. It would require a night closure, probably five hours more. You think? You only get. Four and a half. We'd only get four and a half, so very tight. Um, the other issue with that is if the northern location is indeed preferred, um, can we get the layout area uh, right nearby um, to assemble something and for, for a couple months have it taking up space? Thank you. Um, <clears throat> another question is, um, one of the one of the people that spoke um, from the public mentioned that um, Dick's Sporting Goods was had some objections to the project. In the entitlements process, are are both sites secured from being able to build on in either location? So currently, we're 
or in the environmental process. So this isn't technically a project. So no negotiations in terms of right away can happen until this becomes an actual project within design. Got it. I think that's it for me. Adam? Sure. <clears throat> uh, just there have been some questions about um, timing and funding of the project too. Is there any sort of, I mean, this has been going on for a very, very long time and probably going on for a much longer too. Any concept of that? So I can give you schedule updates. Sure. Um, granted that um, we complete these technical studies, we go through a public open house, we circulate the draft. Um, we are looking to have um, environmental clearance signed off with Caltrans uh, sometime next year early. So probably April 2020. And then at that point, we do have funding secured for the de actual design. And that could happen uh, October 2020, beginning of that fiscal year, federal wise. Um, that particularly uh, schedule for design duration, probably a year and a half. So construction would happen the year mid 2020. Uh, right now, we don't have funding secured for construction, but we do have funding secured for design. Okay. Um, and looking uh, at, at sort of the the landing, um, just at the Dick's Sporting Goods side on the the um, Edwards Elliott uh, side, just uh, concerns me a touch, just because it it really dead ends at that loading dock. I understand that there are the site constraints and. Um, I've followed along with this project for a little while and have evaluated both of the um, the the alignments and um, there's definitely you know there's more people up at the, the northern um, aspect and uh, the it, it seems a little more shoehorned into the into the site into the actual neighborhoods than the southern alignment which fits to me better into the existing neighborhoods, the, um, the uh, existing bike and pedestrian networks that are there and potential future networks too. Um, and uh, there, it, it, it also, in a, in a planning sense, it, 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 it programmatically it fits into the, what used to be the, um, the railroad alignment um, coming across there with the diagonal, which still is expressed in the street grid, which is a nice, there's a nice aspect to that as well. Um, but the main, the main concern is really how it's shoehorned into the, uh, the western, northern um, portion of the site and, and how, um, what I, I, I know that it, it's, it's been um, evaluated, but the safety concerns with barreling down the long ramp to dead end at um, the loading dock. Can you talk a little bit about your thought process for that? It's certainly, we share your concerns, um, and we've done everything that we could think of to address them. Uh, so to create uh, visual elements at the base that are going to capture your attention and show you that you're going to have to slow down, make sure that the sight lines are very open uh, so that you will see trucks and traffic and that mm -hmm. they will see you. Um, this would apply, of course, to the way you light things and the way you deal with the railing and the, fen the, the curbs, I mean, excuse me, the, uh, the handrails. Um, and then, of course, uh, there are some things that we can do with signage uh, as a complement to good design uh, and striping. Uh, but the geom geometry is really what we're stuck with. We've tried to maximize that touchdown area as much as we can within the limitations of ADA slope requirements. Mm -hmm. uh, one last aspect of this is, um, and, and this kind of references back to the gentleman, the civil engineer's comment. Um, uh, I'm gonna take a slight diversion to address that because it's relevant to this, um, which is, uh, we have limited width to work with. So by maximizing the width available to people on the bridge, uh, we can best maximize safety 
uh, for people using it in terms of mode separation, people passing each other, but also in terms of this touchdown area that you're concerned with. Um, and that ties back to the point about um, considering um, concrete structures that have the structure above the deck rather than below. One of the issues with that, and I'll just say that we're considering that type of structure for another project in Santa Cruz, so it's something we're very open to, but in this case, um, that would require additional width. And because it could not be as much of a closed um, uh, point symmetric uh, form, the torsional uh, stiffness would have to be um, achieved by you know greater uh, um, member thickness. In, in, in short, you end up with a lot more uh, you're taking up a lot more of the width where people want to be uh, that that we of the limited width that we have available here and we think it's more important to give that to the people um, uh, the traveled way space yeah I definitely agree um, and I, I appreciate those thoughts and bringing that in actually that does flesh it out a little bit um, and in terms of the actual construction of the bridge um, and the the options, um, I, I do, do think that the the cable um, is. I, I really uh, enjoy the the lighter um, area aspect of it too, and it, it does seem to be to me to provide um, the most space on the actual bridge itself. Um, and then that actually uh, morphs into kind of a question or a comment for staff as well in terms of where we are in the process and where in your discussions going forward in terms of. Uh, your internal meetings if, if this comes back to us um, because in in the process um, and thanks for updating on the timeline I went to one of those public meetings last year um, it was a great public meeting um, and uh, just uh, it it seems um, that we're com commenting on the you know the alignments the general structure of, of potential design um, you know pre sort of preferred alternatives um, or just sort of getting towards something but um, there's a lot left to be determined. Um, and so this, this is almost a, an introduction for, from a design standpoint to what's here. This is, we're looking at larger picture. Um, and then to really drill down on the specifics of the you know, ADA accessibility, the, these specifically how the landings are put there, the lighting, the programming, you know, even getting into the artistic elements. Um, and uh, that seems like it's a lot of that's gonna come at a much later date. Um, which we, um, as this board, would I think, um, I know I would appreciate having another pass at that because as you get deeper into design um, concepts, you, uh, there, you know, there's always things that come up. There's always value engineering that happens. Um, and so kind of bringing it back to having a real um, uh, design uh, say, um, I think it'd be really important at a later date. Um, one of the things about this, um, you know, and all of these, the, the comments about, you know, uh, kind of knitting this, this city back together, this is, a, what's really great is that this is a, an amazing opportunity to right some of the, the planning wrongs or, I don't know, maybe different choices that have happened over the past, you know, 50, 75 years. And so to do something that is not just utilitarian, but is really making a statement, you know, there's been a lot of talk about statements for, um, presenting Santa Rosa um, to the world, to the region, um, to people passing through, and they're, they're you know, having a, a beautiful design and something that is made to be a, a design rather than a utilitarian bridge, if it's possible and affordable in a way, um, or fits into that, who knows if it's affordable, but um, that to have that is a, is a really amazing opportunity to, to, to make a bigger statement and a bigger Piece. And so I think that bringing it back to the design is really great. I mean, thinking about, you know, someone brought, someone brought up the, bay, the new Bay Bridge, um, something like that, where it's making that beautiful grand statement, like the, the Sundial Bridge in, in Reading, there's something like that that's an actual, um, you know, design um, and very beautiful. Um, this could be that, you know, this, this is something where people are driving through Santa Rosa and that this is, you know, it, you know, when you're a kid, you have 
those moments where you pass something on the highway that you that signals where you are, and this is like the entrance to you're getting to the river, or you're getting to wine country, or getting to you know out of the Bay Area. This is this is where you're getting back to it. So this is a real great opportunity. Um, and so I think that if we have another say, that would be great. Yeah, those points are well taken. I will certainly pass those along to the other departments as we continue discussions. Uh, it's an exciting project and it is at an early stage and I can appreciate your comments in terms of wanting to see it as it evolves through this process and gets into a finer level of detail. So I will pass along all of those sentiments. Great, thank you. Yeah, and, and I mainly bring those up to, to say that kind of at this meeting and what we're looking at, it's it's hard to, to know how much detail to go into um, if we're just kind of looking at big picture um, and giving our thoughts and impressions. But we get into real specifics, you know, it's it's hard at this point. So to, ha to have another opportunity to do that, you know, would be great. I think that'll wrap it up for me for now. Thanks, Adam. Drew. Questions and comments? Uh, sorry. Um, why are you not subject to city entitlements, Bill? So there's a provision in the zoning code that essentially says city projects are subject to the minimum extent of the provisions. Uh, the application has been that city sponsored projects do not go through design review, planning commission review. They're just not subject to any of the provisions of the zoning code. Okay, cool. That's, I, I thought there was something in there. I just wanted clarification on that. And then we're in the beginning phases of, I guess, a CEQA EIR or something along those lines tied in with Caltrans and kind of all those elements, right, in terms of your timeline? Yeah, um, same middle. Um, not an EIR, I think we're heading towards more of a negative declaration and okay. maybe you see. CEQA and NEPA, both. Yeah, okay, cool. Um, those are my only like, two questions. Um, I, I think it's an interesting discussion for this board to talk about a bridge over the highway in many ways, because um, we're all uh, design professionals in the kind of building built environment. Um, but what's I think unique about pedestrian bridges uh, is they're an extension of kind of that outdoor space uh, and, and how we move between um, between buildings and between spaces that we occupy. And so um, any sort of width that you can create, uh, I think the, the asymmetrical cantilevered cable stay bridge kind of idea in terms of, it sounds like you're able to maximize that width in terms of bike paths or pedestrian pathways or planters or seating elements or whatever. Uh, so that becomes an outdoor room and less of a bridge, right? It's really kind of a unique situation um, because uh, it's got a pretty nice view of uh, the surrounding area if you're just like on that bridge. There's not many things just kind of like on top of 101. Um, and so I, I, I'm, I'm drawn to the, uh, the kind of the asymmetry of the last option. Uh, for a wide variety of reasons. Uh, it's not clunky, it's clean. Um, we can make a statement as a city in terms of a progressive, a progressive modern statement, I think, um, which I, we've had a lot of projects over the last, I don't know, two years, I said, two and a half years. I guess as long as I've been on the board, two and a half years, um, that are trending in that direction in terms of some modern architecture and some modern infused elements to uh, really push the envelope and to do something that's clunky uh, like our, uh, you know, pedestrian footbridges, quite frankly, which is what they are. They're pedestrian footbridges. They're not, you know, a 70 foot span <laughs> bridge that crosses a highway. To do something like that, I think would be foolhardy um, in terms of just the volume and, and I think for you, the, the maintenance element, I think for the city to take on would be really uh, unfortunate. I mean, if we're gonna spend money on a bridge, right? And then the city has to sink money into maintenance every year to paint it or to clean it or whatever. Um, that wouldn't be the way that I would prefer to go. Um, 
And then as for uh, kind of the connectivity piece, it, it sounds to me like pretty much everybody kind of favors that northern alignment. And I think for many reasons, it does make a lot of sense. It's closer to transit. It's closer to um, kind of areas of activity as opposed to the southern one is kind of in middles of parking lots on both sides um, and in kind of industrial-ish areas on the west side, whereas uh, there's a more engaged element to both sides of the, the northern kind of piece. Um, and then I, I would, I would want to push the envelope in terms of the design. I don't think the little why thing, I mean, it's cool, but, um, you know, uh, if I mean, as far as budget allows, I guess, right? Um, but I think, you know, going a direction with a modern bridge that is a departure from traditionalism would be a way to set Santa Rosa apart in terms of this particular element. And if the city was so inclined to go that way, the design of the bridge itself could make that statement without signage or artwork because the bridge itself is the artwork. Um, so I guess those are my comments and my questions. Excellent, thank you. Eric, questions and comments? I appreciate it. A, a few quick questions, well, um, actually I'll, I'll leave it to comments. Um, I don't think I can help in regards to design. Um, the opposite from Drew, I'm more on the traditional side I prefer the truck, the through truss bridge. Uh, and when we look at what we currently have in Santa Rosa, uh, most of those are the concrete um, girder type. So you have the Fountain Grove overpass, you have the uh, Bicentennial overpass, you have the Earl Street pedestrian bridge is also a concrete girder. Uh, Baker overpass and Corby overpass. So all of those are concrete girders. They're not the most attractive uh, by any means. Uh, but when I look at the tiered arch um, or the tied arch as well as the cable, uh, we don't have anything like that in Santa Rosa. And where my personal opinion is different is that it's really going to stand out, but I'm not so sure necessarily in a good way. So um, I think the through trusses are more consistent with the history of Sonoma County and Santa Rosa. And that, but I also understand that it's more important to get this project moving forward than trying to get funding for a more expensive mo uh, option. So I, I don't think I can provide you much help with design. My opinions are different. And I think the overriding concern is let's get this project going forward because there is a definite need for it. So uh, with that, um, you know, I, I think where, where I'd like to see in regards to whether we're looking at the north option or the south option, uh, in this process, which I didn't hear today, what I would like to see is out re uh, some reaching out to our stakeholders, and those stakeholders being the junior college, the Santa Rosa High School, uh, and looking at where their pop student population is coming from because they have that data. Uh, when you look at where we've built in the last 10 years on the west side of the freeway there by Range, Edward, Edwards, and Jennings Avenue, we have extremely high density housing that's been built in the last two years off of Jennings, uh, Francis, Edwards. And when you look at the southern landing on the west side uh, over by Myers Restaurant Supply, that's a much easier connection point for that high density housing. Um, but again, I would rather than make assumptions, would rather look at data points in regards to how, uh, how many uh, commuters or users there are for the smart train and the smart station there at Guerneville Road, the student population for the junior college, as well as the high school, and use those data points to help us make a decision on the best use, on who, where we're gonna get the most use out of a north location or a south location. That's, that would be the, the only thing really I would encourage. So, thank you. Thank you, Eric, good comments. 
Um, <clears throat> question is uh, on the environmental clearance that you're working on, is the length of time effectively determined by the Caltrans process or is it just the complexities of the site or the sites being considered? You can be honest, I don't see any Caltrans representative here. <laughs> no, so, so Caltrans has a structured, you know, progression for the environmental approval, it's uh, it's it's very, you have to submit one item, then the next, and so forth. So I think a lot of it's attributed to the Caltrans requirements. Um, also, uh, there's been a extensive outreach, uh, which, you know, has also contributed to the development or postponing some of the technical uh, uh, reports because we did open it up to two locations. Mm -hmm. um, and those locations, you know, will be totally evaluated through the uh, draft environmental document and the technical studies in order to obtain comments and, uh, you know, comments on both locations before a decision is made. Um. And that was my other question, is the environmental clearance document is, is considering both landing spots or all four landing points within its current form? Like as far as your parallel pathing, uh, pg and E's. I mean pg and &E, another entity, uh, Caltrans uh, and the other owned sites. Does it consider the... This is the environmental document currently, or is that another sequential step? Like you get through the Caltrans step and then you start evaluating the landing points? No. Um, I'm trying to understand what you say by evaluate the landing points. From an environmental clearance. The environmental clearance would be for the entire project. Yes. So at either location. Okay. Um, and then just from a rough order of magnitude on cost, going from one bridge system to another, what is it like going from the cheapest to the most expensive? Is it 2X, 5X, 10X? Well, I mean, I'm wondering if you can give us a rough understanding of that. We've tried to show you um, and recommend a structure type that would be most cost effective for this, for the particular constraints at this location. Um, could you build a bridge that's cheaper? Yes, um, with significant compromises like big use and more property acquisition and so forth, it's probably possible. But given the goals of the project and the constraints, we've tried to give you something that's clean, simple, elegant, cost effective and constructible. Um, so, um, none of the alternatives that we've shown you, um, I would, I wouldn't say any of them stand out as significantly different in cost. We did mention that there should, there would be a difference in uh, maintenance costs. Mm -hmm. Um, trusses have a lot of surface area, um, equally any type of cable supported, uh, structure will also have some maintenance costs associated with um, tuning the cables. If you choose the right type of detailing and structural system, that can be totally minimized. One of the bridges that I was involved in 22 years ago, the Berkeley Bike Bridge, has never had any maintenance on it and it's doing fine, just to give you a sense. Great, thank you, I appreciate uh cost considerations being a major part of it, and I just wanted to know with what we were looking at as options, what the <coughs> difference would be. Um, I think that, uh, you know, I kind of agree with a lot of what I've heard, even though they've been varying uh, comments. I think that what would I'd be appreciative of is a simple and light and airy design that is unique to Santa Rosa. Um, whether that means that it's drastically modern unique or whether it's more um, attuned to things in Santa Rosa that uh, people are drawn to, that you say, aha, I have arrived, um, that would be appealing as well. But definitely light and airy, and um, everything that you've kind of 
taking a step towards and maximizing width and and um, making all the clearances obviously that are your constraints i think you've done a, a great job in, in getting to where you are and in, in presenting this um, i would echo my fellow board members comments in the fact that we would love to see it again if it uh, can come back through um, that would be much appreciated i think it's a it's a huge project for santa rosa um, it's a game changer and I think uh, you know it sounds like you've done a lot of uh, public comment periods and, and and sessions so that's very much appreciated I would uh, recommend that continues as the design evolves um, my questions to the environmental assessment uh, were mainly going to be if you can be bold in declaring a negative declaration um, I don't see either site maybe the south site on the west side maybe has a little bit of space that hasn't been developed where you're landing but outside of that everything's already paved over or a sidewalk or you know i mean it's pretty clear and the fact that it's in the station area plan um you know that environmental document already exists so um but if it's a caltrans sequential process i've been there so i understand <laughs> um Oh, Chair Kincaid, I had one thing I forgot to mention. Yeah, no um, problem. I'll get to you in two seconds. Is that okay? Yeah, I'll, I'll wrap up real quick. Okay. Um, I think the comment that I heard, uh, having it clear and visible, um, you know, transparent so that everybody can see and people are very safe um, is very, very, very important. Um, and, I, and I agree with Adam and others that the uh, um, drop spot on the west side on the north option uh, is tough and problematic, but I think that it can be worked through. It might not be the uh, best solution, um, having bikes flying off and coming to a dead end, but that might be the safest option and having them jog around a barrier, if you will, um, with lots of signage ahead and truncated domes and that sort of thing. But the, that's kind of how the smart train over crossings at grade level are you going to have to weave your way through so that you kind of slow down and pay attention to what you're getting yourself into um, so that might be an option anyways I, I appreciate being part of the process uh, I know my fellow colleagues do as well and, and if we could continue that would be great so thank you uh, Drew sorry I apologize I had one thing that I had written down here that I forgot to mention um, and it has to do with I think the uh, how we screen and protect pedestrians and bicyclists. Um, I've never been a fan of the chain link solution. I don't think anybody is. Um, and, and I think what is uh, great about your presentation is you're starting to think about those alternate solutions, about what, what is that containing element for the bridge itself. Um, and I think this ties in with the other comments that we've made. If it's you know, it's light and airy and it's modern or whatever, those, you know, that has to translate to that safety guardrail as well. And it can't just be solved with chain link fence with a curl up at the top and maybe some barbed wire, you know, <laughs> like you see. Uh, fortunately, um, Caltrans now allows um, either a recurve over or greater height. So we're looking for the greater height also angle, create more open outdoor space. And finally, we are looking at a cable mesh instead of a chain link. Yeah, and I think that, I mean, that's a, that cable mesh is a really, it's a beautiful design solution instead of, you know, chain link. So I would just, it sounds like you're looking at those things. I just wanted to, I think, make the comment public to staff so they're kind of paying attention to that too, which I think they are. They really they're very good about listening to us when we say, hey, pay attention to this element, guys. And they write down, they pay attention to it. So, thank you. Any other comments, having heard fellow board members speak? You got some comments, Henry? Please. Yeah, I feel like I missed my, my first chance. I only ask questions. <laughs> uh, if, if I don't see this project again, I, I would like to. I kind of echo some of my other board members' comments. We'd, we'd like to see it come back, even if it's just a concept so we can give you our two cents worth as it continues to develop. Um, I'm, I'm kind of torn between the cable stayed bridge and the, and the arch bridge. I, I, the arch bridge um, has, a, has a feel and an element of, of some of the other pedestrian bridges that we're used to in Santa Rosa. 
but you know, I don't, I don't fear uh, modern design, and I think that the asymmetrical uh, cable stay bridge is, is probably my favorite if it had some modifications to it because I don't, I don't like the rabbit ears on the TV look. Um, I think the, um, the, the, the Bay Bridge that just recently done with the, with the pylon uh, being an element that everything else springs off of uh, is a very strong look to it and still keeps the keeps the lightness of the cable state bridge which is my probably my favorite just because of its its super lightness to it and um, I don't think it necessarily has to make a statement other than it's just beautiful when you drive by it and it and at nighttime if the cables maybe had some some lighting on it um, similar to what they've done at the Bay Bridge, I think that, that really accentuates uh, and gives it a whole different look from daytime to nighttime. Um, I, I, I would hope that that pylon in its, in its new form could also be moved between Armory and 101. And I know there's probably a lot of reasons why it maybe can't, but if it could be looked at, I think, it, I think that Pylon would become more of a, a featured element when you drove by it, rather than being kind of a just a chunk off to the side. And I and I noticed that in your in your very early on, uh, well, one of our first presentation pieces of material, which also had an aerial of of the of the northern site, which is my preferred location for the touchdown. But the aerial photo had uh, the site probably just after the demolition of uh, Los Robles uh, restaurant there, because there's, there's nothing there. The Dix isn't even built, and, and uh, it's, it's bare ground. The bank wasn't built either. So I appreciate the length of time you guys have put into this, and I, and I hate to just give you a few comments uh, that would diminish any of the hard work you guys have, have, have gone through to bring it to this point. Um, I, I, I think the touchdown spots. Um, I think that the near near Dix, I think, is is a little bit problematic on the north, even though it's my preferred location. Um, but if I looked at the south one and I drove it today, and I got over on the the Bailey side, and and while you couldn't make a U-turn and get back on the Armory with your bike or or walk, you're you're going to keep cutting through there, and and it's just it's very uh, crowded in there. There's lots of diagonal parking spots. I don't really really see where a bike path could even be put between where it touches down in Mendocino. It's it's uh, I'd be concerned beyond the bridge and how that access connects to to Mendocino. So with that, I I say get the bridge built too. I'd, I'd love to see it. Can I ask a clarifying question? Sure. You're requesting that we consider a single pylon design? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Any other final comments from the board? Adam? Yeah, one question actually was kind of um, brought up in a, a comment that you made about the uh, fencing or not fencing the cable mesh. So you you're, you are think you're getting down to details of thinking of cable mesh versus chain link things like that. Yeah. We're thinking about it, but unofficially. Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay, that that was a question of what, like how close we are getting to the detail. That that goes to my questions of process too. So, of course, I know as designers, we're always thinking about every piece of things, every piece of a project, but. Okay, so that's, yeah, uh, okay. And um, yeah, as, as far as uh, one last comment on the um, utilitarian aspect that um, versus the, um, the beauty is that, I mean, things can be useful and very, very beautiful too. And so I think this is really, I, I really want to stress that. Let's think about that, um, really kind of pushing the design envelope a bit. Um, it's a great opportunity. Thank you, Adam. Um, I think I've heard it a couple times, but uh, I think everyone is very uh, appreciative of all the hard work and, and uh, being steadfast and, and continuing on with the project. So um, greatly appreciate that. Uh, also, I think we're ready. 
So uh, if we can get it built sooner rather than later, that would be uh, fantastic. So thank you for all the uh, public participation as well um, this afternoon. It's much appreciated. Um, with that, I will uh, close item number six and move on to board member reports. Do we have any board member reports? Seeing none, we'll move on to item number eight, department reports, Bill? No department reports. No department reports, okay. Then I believe that brings us to item number nine, which is adjournment. We are adjourned.